Okay, so uh, tonight we're going to look at uh, just a, kind of a core concept of what differs between popular Christianity and traditional, historical, real Christianity. And what I mean by popular Christianity is more and more um, there is uh, there's a group of a group of authors and, and speakers and stuff that call themselves Christians, and they get really popular books. Uh, Rachel Hollis is one of them. Uh, she wrote that book, Girl, Wash Your Face, whatever it's called. I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Um, and uh, different different you know speakers and, and preachers and stuff that they they make it sound like it's Christianity, but the Bible is not really that important to what they're saying, and it's very me focused and it's all about it's all about me. So uh, a lot of these Christian books they teach things like have your best life now and take care of yourself, watch out for yourself, live your truth. God just wants you to be happy. All these things that sound good, and they are definitely uh, anchored on on a piece of on a piece of truth. But the problem is, is that that truth is so twisted. Like, for instance, take the whole live your truth. God doesn't want us to live our truth. He wants us to live in subjection to him, live his truth. You know, the truth is not relative. It's something that's, that's factual, you know. So does he want you to live according to um, having, you know, a conscience and live in accord with your con conscience? Of course he does. But that conscience is scarred and it needs to be remade by uh, by God. So... Um, most of these Christian books uh, and, and stuff that, that I've been reading and, and, and seeing getting real popular lately, they're not really based off of the Bible or off of historical Christianity. And um, really, there's a lot that I could say, but I've kind of had to limit because this is just a one-night thing. So we're just going to kind of hit the highlights. Um, when, I was, when I was younger in church, <laughs> um, some, there were some, some mean-hearted people. And uh, they called themselves Christians, but they were, they were just very mean-hearted people, you know. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of serving. There wasn't a whole lot of love or caring about one another. There wasn't a whole lot of family unity with the body. It was more of just, you know, let's all nitpick each other and complain about each other and attack each other and bite each other's heads off. It just, um, it was a bad experience, I would say, overall. <laughs> Uh, and then when I got in ministry, I thought, you know, that's just that church maybe. And I was surprised again to find out that when you do things like pastor, that you're going to run into mean people again, people who call themselves Christians who aren't really serving God. And uh, it really caught me off, off guard. And that's really what we're going to be talking tonight about is in, in, in real Christianity, there's the presence of suffering. And uh, that's really all we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, because suffering is one of those recurring nightmares. <laughs> you're going to suffer in life, and then if you're in ministry, you're going to suffer for serving God. So it's just kind of one of those things. And uh, I, I guess part of it was just the complete surprise that I felt when um, when bad things happened and I suffered. I thought if I if I kind of got my act together, that God would just kind of make all the doors magically open. It didn't work like that, and uh, really surprised me. So we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about this stuff. So, um, <clears throat> so one of the things I want to mention is that, um, you know, I had this idea that if I do everything right, so if I do my ministry good, if I, you know, do all the right things myself and just focus on being a good person or a good Christian, that uh, that means nothing bad will happen, and if something bad happens, it, it's a sign that you're not living for God. <laughs> Uh, have you guys ever thought something like that? <laughs> We've all been young before, huh? Uh, well, then you get older and you kind of wake up. So, you know, why is this happening? Why do, how do I stop it from happening? But these were the wrong questions because you can't really stop it from happening. And it happens because that's part of life and part of ministry. It's something that was promised. And as we're going to look at tonight, it's something that is actually required to serve God. Um, so life isn't meant to be easy, though, before we get into the scriptures. Life isn't, isn't something that's meant to be easy. A lot, a lot of the Christian books that are coming out, they're all focused on being happy and, and just living a simple, easy life. Life really isn't meant to be easy. I mean, take, for instance, raising kids. If you've done that, <laughs> you know it's very difficult. <laughs> and uh, surely God doesn't want us to stop having kids because <laughs> then we'd all die off. So I'm assuming that God you know, wants us to have kids. But um, it's not easy, and that should kind of point us in the right direction that life isn't meant to just be easy. Um, it, it, but it, life is meant to be purposeful, which is a lot, I think, more important than being easy. Um, 
And we, we kind of have a, a habit of chasing ease, chasing comfort, but it's kind of like chasing a purple dragon. You never actually, never actually get it. And uh, Christianity it was never meant to be about health and wealth. It was meant to be about suffering. In fact, the core message of Christianity is suffering. And that's something that's hard to hear. Um, but the truth is, is that our health is in salvation through Christ. And our wealth is Christ and us, the hope of glory. That's our health and wealth. Not, not, not physical life, health and wealth. And uh, so Christianity won't lead you to comfortable living. And uh, won't lead you to health and wealth either. In fact, usually people who serve God suffer more. So everyone suffers different kinds of sufferings in life. There's life suffering like illness. You're going to get sick at times. It's just going to happen. Um, you know, just kind of a fact of life. Uh, people, you know, mistreating you or something, you're going to have that happen in life. You're going to go through hard situations. If you're in ministry, there's going to be times of suffering and struggling. Absolutely. Uh, you, some, some things you're going to do, you're going to do something stupid and you're going to suffer for your own actions. So that's just another part of it. Um, suffering for others, you're going to try and watch out for others. You're going to try and take care of others and you're going to suffer for it. That's another thing that just happens. But what it all comes down to is the more you obey God, the more you're going to suffer. And I think we see this with Paul in the Bible. I think we see it with Jesus in the Bible. Uh, you know, this is something that Christianity is not the way to have a, have a, what's it called, problemless life. <laughs> so any suffering from, when you serve God, the thing is any suffering from any cause can be repurposed to glorify God. Whether it's something you are earning your own consequences for your own actions, or you're serving ministry, or you just got sick, whatever it is, when you're a Christian, any suffering can, can be repurposed to glorify God. Look what I have learned in this process. Look what God's done for me. You know, I was living in sin and I did this and I was suffering from my own actions and then God just came through and showed his mercy on me. So, I mean, there's so many different things in life where it doesn't really matter what caused the suffering. As a Christian, it can be repurposed to glorify God. Any suffering from... Uh, Suffering is to be expected. Okay, this is this is. I'm going to summarize what we're going to talk, look at look at in scripture, and then we'll go through the scriptures. Uh, suffering is to be expected. Don't let it surprise you when it happens. Uh, suffering is to be endured. It's not meant to be give, given up. We're supposed to persevere through the suffering. And suffering is supposed to be embraced as producing good. The again 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 and again the Bible talks about you know um, I rejoice in my suffering because this happens. It's not that we're sadists and masochists. That's that's not the that's not the thing that we're talking about. But we realize as Christians that bad things can be repurposed by God for our benefit. When those bad chaotic crazy things happen in life, God can give them meaning. God can give us a way forward through them, regardless of what the cause is. And um, And I'm not talking about not. I'm not talking talking about suffering for doing bad things. <laughs> when you do bad things, you're probably going to suffer for that. And that's not that's not like, oh God, how could you let this happen? I mean, if I go and rob a bank, I'm probably going to get arrested. <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's not something I should take out my anger on God for. Uh, so suffering is the only suffering is the only uh, is the only thing that the world produces. Look at what John sixteen thirty three says. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. I'll read it one more time. I have told you these things. He's, he's telling us in advance we're going to have problems. So that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. And what we can see from John 16 is that suffering is the only thing that the world produces. If we go to the world looking for happiness, whether it's sitting on our couches or, or, or whatever, you know, uh, not to say that rest is rest and leisure is a bad thing, but if we're constantly pouring our heart and our life into the world, trying to find happiness and fulfillment with more money and more things, it's not going to happen because the only thing that the world ever gives us is suffering. And so it kind of leaves us with the idea that we should trust the world at our own peril. <laughs> Some things, though, we call suffering and uh, isn't really suffering. Like, for instance, going to work. Going to work isn't suffering. Think about how boring life would be if you sat at home doing absolutely nothing all day, every day. I mean, that would be terrible. <laughs> sometimes we, we maybe are discontent. Sometimes we hate our job. 
Sometimes that kind of stuff happens. But think about this. Even Adam and Eve had jobs in the Garden of Eden before they fell. Before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve were given a job to do in the garden. Think about this. We were created to do things. We were not created to sit on our bus and do nothing. <laughs> I know on kids' shows, it's a real common thing to have, you know, back before Adam and Eve sinned, it was just this place where you sit around and do nothing all day. But that's not really what we see. And in fact, if you look to Scripture again, it talks about the new heavens and new earth, and it tells us again about how we're going to have jobs to do. You're not just going to be sitting in heaven on a cloud strumming a harp. Like, that sounds really boring. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe it sounds good to you, but to me that sounds boring. So work isn't really a part of suffering. Um, it's more, work is more an opportunity. Um, for instance, jobs can fund a ministry, whether it's yours or somebody else's. Um, if nobody worked, how would the church stay open? How would we do things like the widow's luncheon? How would we be able to send missionaries to go to different countries? How would we give Africa clean water like we did with the, that missionary that was here just a couple weeks ago? How would we do all these things if it wasn't without money? So money, you know, money can be used for good and, and jobs aren't really suffering. So now that we've gotten all that, let's talk about the actual suffering process. As Christians, the immoral culture that we live in should bother us. Okay, look at what Second Peter 2.7 says. He rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the depraved behavior of the, of the immoral. The idea here is that as we seek God, we're not supposed to look at the world and say, it's actually perfect and, and pleasing, and I'm just so happy. We're suppo there's supposed to be a little bit of a uh, dissonance where we know that this isn't our home, where we know that this is, this is not satisfying me spiritually you know what i mean and it doesn't really matter what you go to in life it was never meant to meant to satisfy and that's part of suffering in christ when you set your affection and, and your love and your hope on christ and on the next life there's this kind of essence of every day being a struggle in a way because you're not living for money and wealth and 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 and, and, and fame like all your friends are you know uh, and so that's one of the one of the processes of of suffering As Christians, suffering isn't just from people in the world, though. We also suffer from other Christians. And we suffer from those people who call themselves Christians that aren't really Christians. Uh, we suffer as a Christian. We suffer as a minister. We suffer just to be alive. Um, and in life, you're going to have some people who will hurt you repeatedly and some people who are going to hurt you on occasion. And it's important to remember to forgive because if you're looking for somebody to never hurt you in life, you will never find that person. And you just become very guarded. Like, oh, no, I can't trust anybody. It's like, well... In the sense that everybody's going to eventually let you down, yeah, ever, yeah. Don't hold them to an impossible standard. But there is a difference between you know people who constantly, you know, cause problems, like in a church, for instance, and those people who mess up. Like, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm somebody who I'm not going to stab you in the back. I'm going to mess up and, and I'm going to irritate you sometimes. I'm going to do things that you don't like sometimes, and I don't mean to do that. It's just part of me being a person. And I'm sure all of you guys will do that to me too. I mean, that's a part of being being a person. Um, hopefully we're growing and learning, but we are still people. And uh, I, I want to go to suffering with this idea. That look, at, look at suffering as the way that God promotes you. Because the more, the more, the more God elevates you, the more suffering you're going to go through. I mean, think of it like this. Pretend you're running a business at the same business that you used to not run. You, you, let's say you started out as a grunt worker and then you got to a manager. Running a business is a lot harder than working for the business. You have more stress. You have more things to care about, more things to worry about, more pain. And that's kind of how it works. The more God promotes you, the more pain you have to go through. The more, uh, and when God brings you through a painful thing, he'll take you to another level of your faith, another level of your walk with him, another level of, of ministry. You can only get there, though, with pain. I mean, think about your marriage as a great example. You get married, everything's great. I mean, nothing the other person does can remotely bother you. <laughs> I mean, they're just, everything's great. I love their laugh. I love their smile. Well, you've been married 10, 15, 20 years. And I hate their laugh. I hate their smile. I hate everything about them. <laughs> just kidding. But uh, you surely get what I'm saying. There's a level where you go through pain in marriage, and then your marriage gets better. Or it crumbles. There always comes to these parts, these, these tears of pain. And if you can rise above the pain, then you grow and your marriage grows. If you fell, you, there's, there's no sting where you are. And it's the same thing with Christ. God will bring us to areas of pain and levels of pain. So if you're going through, through pain in life, that's a good thing. 
It means God is changing your heart. He's working in you. He's preparing you for the next day. Just like um, a good a biblical example of this would be Joseph in, in the book of Genesis. He's living, he's living in his dad's house. <laughs> you guys are all going to bow down to me. Well, then he becomes a slave. So he goes to go through pain, and then he gets promoted. And then he goes through pain again, and then he gets promoted. And it, it ends at the end of the story. He's number two in all of Egypt. But he had to go through a lot of pain to get the promotions. You know what I mean? Um, and, and we could go through more examples, but I think you guys get what I'm saying. God warns us about pain, though, so that we will be prepared, not caught off guard, and prepare ourselves. My problem when I got into ministry is I, I didn't pay attention <laughs> to those warnings. Those little things that God was trying, and God tells us in his word, I, I didn't really pay attention. I knew a whole a lot of things about the Bible. And I could explain really hard to understand things. Yeah, I could do that. But I, I missed the force of the trees, and I wasn't applying it to my, to my situation myself. So, hmm. Okay, so first off about suffering. Suffering is always temporary. It doesn't matter what pain you're going through in life. It's temporary. It doesn't matter if you have cancer. It's temporary. Every pain that we can possibly go through in life is always temporary. We know that we have a home waiting for us. We know that this is not the end of the story. We might go through a lot of pain, sometimes more pain than we can handle. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't exactly <laughs> know how that works. I mean, I, I'm reading a book right now by a guy named Tim Hansel. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him. But uh, he was uh, a hiker, and he fell and injured himself seriously. Uh, where it, this something like collapsed his, his spine. Something like that. Like, not, the collapse isn't the right word, but like, did this to it. And uh, he, he woke up in pain. Every, he, he wrote in one of his books, he said, I don't remember what it was like to wake up and not be in such intense pain. And uh, now my, my situation doesn't sound so bad when I read words like that. But uh, no matter what it is, it's temporary. I mean, now he's dead in heaven. He's not done with the pain now. And uh, we, look to, we look to death as though it's this, this, this final nail on the coffin, like this, this really bad thing. But it's the start of what God is leading us to. 1 Peter 5.10 says, The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. So suffering is always temporary. So, and next off, present sufferings earn us eternal war rewards. The sufferings that we go through in life, they earn us rewards in heaven. This is what 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, for our, for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. It is producing that weight of glory. Think about that. This is something that we are getting rewarded for. It's not, not pointless. So that's, that's a good thing. Suffering makes the, makes the rubber meet the road, so we get spiritual depth. It, it, it makes our Christian walk become real. If we never went through suffering, our Christian belief would kind of just be surface. You know, let's look at this. Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions because we know that afflictions produce, produces endurance, endurance produces character, proven character produces hope, this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So suffering helps us to helps that faith to become real. Another thing that, that suffering does is it brings uh, maturity in us, um, not just spiritual, but also uh, physical maturity, uh, mental, mental maturity. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. See, I, I used to think that, that pain and, and suffering in these difficult situations, that they were a bad thing. And then I realized that there are some times when that's the only way that God can speak to me, the only way that God can grow my faith, the only way that God can break me out of my area of, of comfort. It's the only way that God can take me to the next level is by taking me through pain. Pain isn't something for us to fear and run away from. It's, some, it's not something for us to seek out. <laughs> it's something for when it comes, for us to leverage it and say, how can I grow from this? What is God trying to show me in this? Uh, suffering produces a greater trust in God. 
Now, 2 Corinthians 1.8 says, We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength, so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. See, we went through all this bad stuff. It seemed like it couldn't get worse. We, were, we didn't even want to live anymore. We just reached the end of our rope. You know, this whole, people tell you all the time, they say, um, uh, uh, you're strong enough. Or they say, you know, um, God will never give you more than you can handle and, and all that. Well, verses like this show us that that's not true. God is a frequent uh, user of more than we can handle for the sake of our good. It's for our, for our, for our best that he does this. Um, another thing that suffering does is it focuses us on eternity. If it wasn't for suffering, I think we would all be a lot more concerned about our paychecks and a lot less concerned about what happens next. What rational, what, what, what rationale is there in giving up things that I own and all that I'm working for for a reward that I don't even get to see here? I have to wait until I'm dead to see it. See what I mean? It's, it's all about God. Once you make that connection, we start seeing things. Our suffering became, becomes not such an Im impossible weight. It's something that we know we're working towards something, and it's, it's, it, we're going to get there. It's going to be okay. Instead, rejoice as you share. I'm sorry, 1 Peter 4.13. Instead, rejoice as you share in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. This is why I don't understand all these, all these new pop culture Christian books and stuff where they're talking about a life without suffering and, and, and without sacrifice and it's all about you and you being happy and living for yourself. I don't, I don't get how they can even misquote the Bible to say this because suffering is like hand in hand with the gospel. The gospel is suffering. To know Christ is to suffer. <laughs> like it's part of life. You give up on your passions. You give up on, on your dreams. God gives you new ones. You give up on, on your own selfishness and, and God gives you outlets to pour love and service into others. It's one of those things where it's the heart of the Christian message. Why did Jesus come? Did he come for to just to be happy and healthy and to get all, and to get uh, uh, money and stuff? No, <laughs> he didn't even have that good of a job. So, um, with great joy when his glory is revealed. So it's temporary. It earns rewards. It makes it real. Our faith real. It brings maturity. It produces trust. It focuses us. And the next thing, it, it, it brings uh, rejuvenation. Our suffering brings God's rejuvenation. 2 Corinthians 4, 8-10 says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body, the suffering, so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. So this is, this is a process that begins in this life, but it doesn't reach its fulfillment until the next life. Which I mean, that kind of seems like it's it's better. I mean, if this was all it was all the good it was going to get, doesn't really bode well for heaven, does it? Um, some uh, there are some blessings that come to us, and they only come through suffering. Um, and I'll give two examples after we read Matthew five ten. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. There are some suffer and some blessings that only come through the sufferings. Um, I, I think about our journey with adoption and how difficult it was and how big of a pain um, dealing with the state was and um, dealing with the temperament issues of children who have to be rehomed and stuff. It's a very difficult process. Uh, extremely, <laughs> extremely difficult. Obviously, you know, you keep telling yourself, hey, it's for, it's for a good cause, it's for a good cause, but that doesn't make it any less aggravating. I mean, it is still extremely aggravating, and there's sometimes that you just kind of, you kind of lose, lose your cool in the moment. But through that, I now have a bigger family. I now have, you know, more kids to love. <laughs> I mean, it, good things came from it. And I learned a lot of things, too. Like, for instance, the state is a pain in the butt to tell. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean real lessons. I learned real lessons, you know. Yeah, about, you know, what real love is. I mean, I, I already talked to you guys about this once, but no matter how righteous your motives, when you go to adoption, somewhere in the back of your head, there's an idea that they need to be thankful for what you did and what you sacrificed. You don't know that it's there. Nobody does. That you think that you're all, you always think that you only have good motives. That's, that's human nature. And then, you, and then when they do something, you think, how dare they do that? 
they should be thankful. And then you're like, oh, oh. see what I mean? And I wouldn't have known that I had that little bit of nastiness in my heart had I not gone through the terrible situation. Uh, another example is colitis. You know, this is something I wouldn't wor wish on my worst enemies. However, I learned a lot of very valuable things from it. And those are blessings that I wouldn't have gotten had I not gone through the suffering. So another thing about suffering is it draws us to others and gives empathy. So it helps us to seek others that we can serve, but it also helps us connect with people who suffer in similar ways to us. Yeah, so I'm talking about two different things. I'm talking about it motivating us to, to serve other people, but I'm also talking about it connecting us with people who have gone through similar things. So it, suffering gives us empathy. 2 Corinthians 1 through 3, 4 says, The God of all comfort, he comforts us in our affliction, in all our affliction, so that the purpose being we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction. God doesn't just give us comfort so that we can live our life in peace and never suffer. He gives to us so that we can give to others. There's kind of a flow chart in the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't stop with you. It starts with you, and then it flows. It's, I think it's 2 Timothy says it like this. Find people that you can disciple who will then go on and disciple others. And the idea isn't that you just make disciples of Christ. It's that you are raising people who are raising people, and it's spreading out. And that's kind of how the blessings of God work, too. Not meant to be hoarded. God gives you money so that you can give. God gives you things so that you can give. God gives you time so that you can give. He doesn't give us these things so we can just say, hey, I can have a good, comfortable life of enjoying myself. And I think that's the reason why we really don't like suffering is because it reminds us of the temporary nature of life. And it reminds us that, you know, in areas that we're being selfish. For instance, I think that I'm doing a pretty good job. I'm not too selfish. And then I read about a missionary who gives up everything, and then their wife and their kids are murdered because they're telling people about Jesus. And I'm like, maybe I'm not doing as good as I thought I was. <laughs> see what I mean? Like, there's this, it's comparison. We want to see heroes in ourselves and enemies in everybody else. That's just, it's human nature. We, 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 like, that, we like it that way. But the Bible kind of wakes us up to what's really in our heart. <laughs> and it ain't purdy. Suffering is a privilege done for Christ. Okay? And, and so let's, let's take this apart. Suffering is a privilege. It's something that God grants the worthy. Is, is, is a way you could say that. In fact, in Acts, there's a part where they, where they get persecuted, and they say, we were counted as worthy to be persecuted for the name of Christ. So it's, it's a privilege, which is kind of foreign to our way of thinking about things. <laughs> but uh, this privilege is done, we, we suffer through it, for the sake of Christ and his kingdom. And then in the process of this, it's a witness to others. The more we suffer for God's kingdom, the more it's a witness to others. So let's look at this. Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf. It granted. It's like, here you go. I didn't really ask for that. But <laughs> Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Not just to believe in him, not just to have faith in God but also to suffer for him. And this is something that applies really to all Christians. So suffering is a privilege, and uh, suffering is a consequence of living for God. It's something that is unavoidable, and I wish I could get more into this, but suffering is not only necessary, a necessary part of the Christian life, it is a required part of, of, the, of the Christian life. 2 Timothy 3.12 uh, 3, says, In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I, I'm pretty sure that that's pretty blunt. I don't think he's going to get any People Choice Awards saying stuff like that. I mean, that's not going to sell a bestseller book. That's, yeah, that's not good. We need, to, we need to correct that. In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus might have to go through a few unpleasant things. It's not funny? Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, suffering is a consequence of living... Uh, I already said that one. I lost my line here. Suffering is a, is a requirement of Christianity. It's a, it's, it's a part of following Christ. Matthew 10.38 says, Whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So not only can we expect suffering and, and, and it's necessary, it's also required that we suffer for the, for the sake of Christ. <laughs> to be a Christian is to suffer. Suffering purifies us. It uh, marks us as God's possession. First Peter 4.1 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, 
Arm yourselves also with the same understanding because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. And that doesn't mean that they no longer sin. It means that they've, they've, they've drawn the line in the sand. They're, they're done with living in sin. They're, they're, they're ready to live for Christ. So the longer we follow Jesus, the, uh, the more we, inf- we, we, we self-inflict suffering. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny, deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me, then they will find it. Um, obviously, we're not talking about some people have kind of taken this uh, dark area. And uh, kind of did the whole, like, I think it's called self-flagellation, you know, like the whipping yourself. And that's, that's definitely not what we're talking about. <laughs> but we are talking about submission, uh, sub- submitting our, our, wills to God, our, our will to God and uh, what comes with that. Suffering is a necessary part of, of, of life, but also even more so for the sake of Christ. It marks us as Christ. Uh, suffering is sometimes God speaking to us. Sometimes he'll bring punishments by to help us to, to listen because we get kind of clogged in the ears. Um, and, and regardless of, of whether suffering is from is from directly from God or not, either way, it's going to help us to listen to Him. I mean, if you're going through, you're just minding your own business, and you go through suffering suffering for no reason whatsoever, God can still use it to get you to listen. Uh, suffering also prompts us to love others in actions not just by saying that we love them, but to love them in actions. I, you know, like I talked about being motivated to loving other people. It helps us to see their perspective. And suffering really is the only way to grow. It's one of those things that just, it's not going to happen unless, unless there's some process of, I mean, think of it like this. If you have a kid and you just give them money, you give them a huge financial inheritance, and they never learn the value of money, and they just kind of get spoiled, right? But something happens when you have to work for that money. You know what I'm talking about? Like you, you learn the value of money. You learn the value of sweat. You, you learn the value of these things. And that's a good thing. You know, that, that, that's, I actually try to talk as much as I can. I try to talk people out of giving financial uh, inheritances to their kids because it just hurts them in the long run. Um, you want to do something with your money when you're gone, give it to something like you know missionaries to use in Africa or in Asia. Or do something like that. Now, that way there's no family squabbles when you're gone and, you build up more reward for you in heaven. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like, a, sounds like a, a good thing. The more you suffer here in life, in this life, the more reward you, you get in the next. I mean, that, that's a good thing. Uh, but the thing is, we don't have to let suffering have a purpose. We don't have to let our suffering have a purpose. If we want, we can allow ourselves to get hard and bitter and rebellious to God. We can cause our, our pain to make, a, make us lose faith in God. We, we can do that if we want. It's totally up to us. Just because we're going through suffering doesn't mean that it's going to come out well. The same as in a marriage, you can either have a stronger marriage or a divorced marriage. It's the same thing with Christ. You have the options. It's totally up to you. And uh, we are called to bring peace. We are called to bring uh, peace in others' suffering. Uh, so uh, one thing is that pastor always mentions that we're not Christians aren't just supposed to be peace enjoyers. We're supposed to be peacemakers. We go into uh, we go into bad situations. We bring peace in our family squabbles and our work environment and that kind of stuff. <coughs> and uh, we are called to bring peace in other suffering. That that is the message of the gospel: uh, peace and restoration to God. Um, so with greater ministry, obviously it requires greater sacrifice, and greater sacrifice means greater pain. Everybody says, I want to grow, right? Everybody says, we, we all know that, right? We want to grow. We want to, we, we always say that in our prayer, God, I want me to, I want, I want to grow. But growth, by its nature, requires pain. See, in order for something to grow, it has to change. In order for it to change, something has to be lost. And in order for something to be lost, now there's pain involved. I mean, even getting saved involves pain. The process of growth inevitably leads to pain. So if you want to grow, you're going to have to go through pain. Avoid getting, uh, how can you avoid uh, getting, getting hard when you're going through pain? By seeking God. You have to learn how to seek God through the pain. And that's really, really the best thing there. Um, and I talked earlier, I said that, that when you go through pain, you have to learn how to leverage that pain. And we're, this is the last point. We're going to close up with this. Uh, 
how, how, how can you leverage that pain? You leverage pain by, let, first off, letting it motivate you. When you go through pain, don't get self-centered. Don't focus on, 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 on the things you're going through, how, how, how bad it hurts. Think about how you can use it as, as a platform or motivational thing to go. Hey, I almost died. Great. What are you going to do with the time left to you? Oh, I have this really painful, painful uh, 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 disease. Okay, so how can you use that to prompt you into greater service? I, I mean, here's a great example. I knew one woman who she barely got any sleep because she was just in constant levels of pain. Uh, even with, they were putting on heavy, heavy pinkers and it just didn't work. And um, so she started using it as, as those painful times when she woke up in, in great pain became her special prayer times. It wasn't her times of pain, it was her times of prayer. And she repurposed that, those times of pain. And that's just a good example of how you can have it motivate you. When instead of getting all the attention on me, how can I get the attention on God and on his kingdom and on others? Another way to leverage pain is adapt to it. When pain comes at us, it shows us levels of want in our lives, levels that are lacking in our lives. Maybe an area that we aren't very loving and maybe an area that we aren't very patient in, maybe an area that we, you know, don't really care for God's best in that situation. I mean, for, here's a good example. Sometimes when we're going through uh, physical issues, we don't really care about what the benefit is for God's kingdom in the long haul. We care about getting out of the pain. You know what I mean? <laughs> but if we allow ourselves to adapt to the pain, the, 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 the circumstances we're going through, uh, rebellious kids, uh, death of a, lo a loved one, sickness, whatever that pain in life is, if we allow ourselves to adapt to it, we can find a way forward and find a way to greater impact other people. Um, and learning from it. When you go to pain, you say, okay, well, what can I possibly learn from this? Um, one thing that Kaleidos has taught me is that God doesn't need me to be a physical, perf physically perfect specimen for him to use me. That's a valuable lesson for me. A young guy, yeah, that's a very valuable lesson to me. Maybe it wouldn't mean a whole lot to you guys, but to me it meant something. Um, another thing is uh, how, you, how you can leverage pain. Allow it to help you to relate to others. Okay, so I'm going through pain. Now I can understand those people who don't come to church because they're in pain. See what I mean? Now instead of being a judgmental person, I can now be a more compassionate person and try to motivate them to getting back involved with compassion instead of with judgment. See what I mean? Changes our perspective. And that's really the last thing I have to say. So this last slide, this last slide is a joke slide. I have to say that because I don't want you guys to take it seriously. <laughs> <laughs>